Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Clayton Boyce. I'm news editor for the Knight Ritter Tribune News Service and president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you who are listening to this program on National Public Radio or watching on C-SPAN. Before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind you of our upcoming speakers. Tuesday, January 19th, James Carville, the chief strategist for Clinton Gore 92, will join us. January 22nd, Linda Bloodworth Thomason and Harry Thomason, co-chairs of the Clinton Gore inaugural, will discuss politics in Hollywood. On January 27th, Julia Child speaks about gastronomy as a profession. And on January 29th, Governor Roy Romer, chairman of the National Governors Association, speaks about the governor's agenda for the Clinton administration. Audio and video tapes of press club luncheons are available through the National Press Club Library or by calling 1-800-952-TAPE. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. I'll ask as many as time permits. Um, when Jackie Mason is, is the speaker, uh, things are a little bit different. So today, we've put out microphones. You may also just walk up to the microphone and ask a question. Um, he's not even going to give a speech, uh, which is some of the speeches I've heard here. It's, it's a, a blessing. <laughs> uh, I'd like now to introduce our head table guests and ask them to please stand briefly when their names are read. Before I do that, I, we don't usually answer viewer mail on this program, but um, I have a letter here from some uh, John Bassler in Anchorage, Alaska. Since we're doing everything different today, I hope Mr. Mason doesn't mind. He writes, I've listened quite regularly to NPR's uh, uh, National Press Club luncheons and found them informative and interesting. I have one, but one criticism. There is one redundant expression used consistently, which I find distracting and not up to the standards of such an astute group. It is used when introducing those at the head table, when the president says, on my left, you're right. The addition of this gratuitous phrase, you're right, suggests that those not at the head table are unable to make this calculation on their own. <laughs> it is not only superfluous, but a demeaning phrase. Maybe the speaker uses this to verify that he himself can properly interpolate the introduced person's place as viewed by the audience. That could be true. At any rate, may I politely suggest that this condescending additional phrase be dropped forever. Well, John Bassler of Anchorage, Alaska, you asked for it. So, <laughs> down here. <laughs> Mike Waldman of Newsday. <laughs> Lars Eric, Eric Nelson, a Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Daily News. There's only one Eric in there. That's right. Shannon Taylor, Mr. Mason's guest. Mick Rood of Biotech Daily, King Publishing, and a member of the NPC <coughs> Board of Governors. Joe Rosenfeld, wife of the speaker. Jonathan Salant, Newhouse News Service, and chairman of the NPC Speakers Committee. This is his last luncheon as chairman. Kim Mills of the Associated Press. Alan Emery of the Watertown Daily Times. Judy Matthews, Ottawa News Service. Bruce Alpert, New, or New Orleans Times Picayune. Doug Turner, Washington Bureau Chief of the Buffalo News and the member of the NPC Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. <laughs> Doug was also assisted by our NPC staff members Liz Reagan, Dale DeMisa, Pat Thornsbury, and Armando Medina. Our speaker today, or question answerer today, is Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason's three brothers are rabbis. His father was a rabbi. His grandfather was a rabbi. His great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather, well, I think you get the idea here. So why did Jackie Mason become a comedian? 
Well, he says, somebody in the family had to make a living. <laughs> Jackie has been living off the laughter of others for decades, from the old Ed Sullivan show to his current TV program that cable TV subscribers can see over Superstation WWOR, Channel 9 in New Jersey. That sounds like a plug, Jonathan. <laughs> The last show of that series airs January 19th. He's also wowed them on Broadway with The World According to Me and his recent show, Jackie Mason, Brand New. Broadway made him a one-man award industry. Those shows won him a Tony Award, Outer Circle Award, and Ace Award. The home box office version of his show won an Emmy Award. The album version was nominated for a Grammy. He skewers everybody and everything. Dan Quayle, airport security, savings and loans, the weather, dating, and of course, Jews and Gentiles. He is the author of an autobiography, Jackie Oi, <laughs> and starred in the movie Caddyshack 2. He has performed before Queen Elizabeth, has received an honorary degree from the Oxford University Union, and has been honored by the Israeli government for his support during the Persian Gulf War. Born in Wisconsin in 1931, Jackie Mason grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Like the rest of his family, he also was ordained as a rabbi, but then switched to comedy. Just as well, how many of you would have come today if our speaker was going to deliver a sermon rather than an hour of jokes? That's what I thought. On behalf of the National Press Club, <laughs> let's welcome our speaker, comedian Jackie Mason. I'm going to start by asking some questions on the cards. If anyone would like to speak up, walk up to the microphone and ask a question, that's fine. Uh, the first question is, are you running for mayor of New York City? <laughs> well, I am. Uh, I am thinking about it, but I haven't made any decision about it yet. I think there have been uh, so many uh, politicians who turned out to be comedians. It's about time they had a comedian who might be a politician. <laughs> But I didn't really make up my mind yet. I do come from New York. It's hard to tell, but that's where I come from. <laughs> people can't believe it because from the way I talk, people seem to think I come from Alabama. <laughs> but I am a New Yorker and I'm concerned about the city. And uh, I've had a rough, difficult life in New York as a kid and I uh, appreciate the thought of becoming a hit and making some degree of success in New York. You know, uh, my father was a big businessman. Unfortunately, he was ruined in the crash. Some big stockbroker jumped out of a window and fell on his pushka. <laughs> when you think that over, you'll find out that's a good joke. But, <laughs> but when you uh, come from the kind of an environment that I come from, and you struggle all your life in the same area, and you find that now everybody in New York is wondering how to get the hell out of there, and people are literally afraid to walk in the streets, and people accept the murder, mayhem, and destruction as a way of life. You know, if it was happening in a foreign country, they would consider it a war zone and America would be sending troops to make the peace. <laughs> the United Nations would be having meetings if 2,000 people or 4,000 people a year are getting killed and 20,000 are being injured and mugged and uh, this kind of violence is taking place every single year. What do you think would happen? Do you think the world would stand still and watch it happen in a foreign country? Never. We went into Panama because they, they hurt one Jew. And we found out he was selling drugs like it was news to everybody. We were his partner. <laughs> we were his partner for 30 years. We supplied him with all the cash. Then he sold the drugs. Ha-ha, the knife to sell drugs. <laughs> we paid for it every day. <laughs> he was Bush's partner. He was everybody's partner at the government. Now, I'm not getting paid for this show. I can tell the truth. <laughs> we're, we're living in what's supposed to be the greatest democracy in the world. Here is a guy, Clinton, just became president just became president. A man whose biggest accomplishment is the governor of Arkansas, a place nobody ever heard of. <laughs> nobody ever lived there. It's a place with a farm without people. <laughs> he says employment went up. If two people get a job, employment went up. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, did you, his accomplishments in the environment is that he's 50th in environment. You know, that's not easy. A place without industry is 50th in the environment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is called a democracy. Here's a man who accomplished nothing in his life as being inaugurated president, and I'm a man who accomplished everything, and I'm working for nothing. <laughs> I'm talking at a lunch for people who never heard of me, don't care that I showed up. Do you understand this? This country doesn't make sense. He was supposed to be an agent of change, change, all the change that he was supposed to accomplish. He got 13 lawyers, all millionaires, who made a living from the system by not changing anything. If God forbid something changes, they're wiped out. So are they going to be the agents of change? Bullshit. <laughs> Is that acceptable on C-SPAN bullshit? <laughs> no. It's not. All right, so we'll leave that out. <laughs> we'll edit that out later. Um, I, I told you this was going to be different, didn't I? <laughs> what does New York have that Washington doesn't? <clears throat> what does New York that Washington doesn't? Me. I'm the only thing New York has that Washington doesn't. I don't know what you mean, but what does New York have that Washington doesn't? New York has a lot of things, that a lot more murder than Washington, but not per, per capita. Or uh, proportionately, I don't think there's more murder in New York. I think uh, Washington is closer to the capital of, of crime than it is to the capital of being the government. It's, isn't it the most ironic twist in the world that this is the seat of government of America and it's also the place where the highest level of crime is in the country. So the government of this country can't control the crime across the street from the, main, from the White House. But they're supposed to control the crime in every other country in the world. Except when you walk into the street right in the front of the White House. In front of the White House, you could get killed, but we're making sure that nobody gets killed in Panama. <laughs> if we stop controlling Panama and try to control the streets of these neighborhoods, it would be a great country to live in. You can't walk at any street in Washington and feel safe, or in New York. Nobody walks straight to New York or Washington. Everybody walks like this and looks like that. <laughs> you ever see a person walking in the street at night in any of these major cities? So I said to Irving, did you see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always believed that. Very <laughs> Sure, we have to look. <laughs> and this is considered the greatest democracy in the world. And we have an attorney general who hired two Peruvians, illegal immigrants, to work for her all her life in the house so she shouldn't have to pay $10 an hour. Peruvians work for nine and a half. <laughs> so to save a half a dollar an hour, she hired illegal immigrants to work for her, and she's your new attorney general, and this is the agent of change. <laughs> Change what? Change one type of criminality for another? She is a crook herself. She's a fraud. She's a liar. She doesn't belong in any government. This is a fake phony yenta. She should be outside sweeping streets. It's Nazi bastards. If you hired a Peruvian immigrant right now and you were caught with an illegal immigrant in your house, you would go to jail. This yenta becomes an attorney general. Uh, didn't you support Rudy Giuliani for, uh, for mayor last time? Uh, it said he's running again. Will you support him again? I don't know if I'll support Rudy Giuliani because I don't know, I don't know uh, yet what I'm going to do about the mayorality campaign in New York. Because I, don't, I don't know if everybody depends on my opinion about who to vote for. I've seen people get elected whether I liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I wouldn't hire a Peruvian for attorney general, but Clinton didn't ask my opinion. But the, po <laughs> but the point is, uh, the point is Rudy Giuliani, I wanted him for mayor of the city of New York because I was at that time against Koch. I uh, felt that Koch was not doing anything about race relations in New York, and I felt race relations were in, were, uh, in ferment, there was turmoil, there was tremendous problem about race relations when Koch was, uh, was the mayor. I don't think he's in any way a racist, but because he was so blunt and firm in his remarks, uh, you have to be very careful. You see, when a black person talks about whites, he could call you a racist day and night, you're all racist pigs, and everybody will applaud. Thank God the mayor noticed it. But if you say a black person might be even implied to be a racist, you become a low-life degenerate, you can't say it. 
because no black person could possibly be a racist. They could only call you a racist. This is not to say that blacks are more racist than white, but they're certainly black racists. It's, it's not so hard to find, but nobody's allowed to mention it. Is this a democracy now only if you're black? It makes as much sense as being a democracy only if you're all white. Why is one kind of a person allowed to talk and not the other? Which side is racist when this happens? And why do we accept racism on any side? Go ahead. <laughs> I see you got no answer to this question either, but let me tell you about Rudy Giuliani. I'm almost finished. Okay. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani, I wanted for you because I felt he's a great crime fighter and I failed the greatest problem in New York is the degree of violence that takes place on the streets of New York. And I felt we need a great crime fighter. And the greatest crime fighter, in my opinion, who ever lived is Rudy Giuliani, the greatest. He puts people in jail whether they're guilty or not. <laughs> <laughs> they keep asking, well, how about the evidence? He said, don't mix me up with evidence. I got no time for evidence. All I know is I caught another person. Thank God. <laughs> he fears nobody until I said the White Schwarzer. I don't know if you remember in that campaign in New York, I said the White Schwarzer. I was kidding because I always say it on Broadway and I got a Tony Award for, for, kibitzing, for kibitzing in Jewish about uh, blacks. And I said the White Schwarzer. So uh, it became a big hit, and I felt when Giuliani was campaigning that since everybody knows I'm a comedian, they'll take it with a grain of salt, they'll just realize that uh, I, it's impossible for me to be a racist. So they'd know that I'm kidding, so I said the white Schwarzer when I was referring to Dinkins, and it became a cause celeb, but all of a sudden I sounded like a Nazi to every Jew, and it's, it's ironic, the blacks in New York, African Americans, what's their name now? Now it's African American. Blacks are like women. Their title changes every two weeks. You can't keep up with it. <laughs> a woman used to be a girl. If Then the girl became disgusting, so you said a woman. The woman was disgusting, you had to call her a lady. Then you had to call her a miss. Unless she was married, she was a missus. Then she gets a divorce, she's a... <laughs> now every time you see a woman, you say, Hello, are you miss... And it's the same problem with the blacks. People are so fearful of what to say to a black person. Years ago, I remember it was disgusting when they called him a nigger. Nigger was a disgusting word, so you said negro. That had class. Then negro became disgusting, so you called him black. Black became wiped out. Now it's African American. Now you have to buy a paper every day to find out what's his title now. I don't know. <laughs> While I'm saying African American, it might become something else. It might be called a Schwarze Jew. I don't know. <laughs> So now every time I meet a black person, I say, hello, what's your name? I don't know. <laughs> Do me a favor, I could say, call not a woman, and between the two, you make up a title you both agree on. Even, a, even Gentiles, Goyim, have no titles. <laughs> Do you know if a, a Goyim is not a plain guy? If you're talking to a Gentile, you have to know where he comes from. Every Gentile has countries. As soon as you say, hello, I'm half English, I'm a third Spanish, I'm from my father, French, I'm part, I'm part German, I'm a, Another part, they come in 37 parts, you need a map. You need a map when you're talking to a Gentile. Are you half English? No, I'm a third Scotch, I'm a fifth, I'm a, I'm a fourth. I said, are you a guy or not? That's all I want to know. <laughs> See, a Jew is proud to be a Jew. I'm Jewish. He don't know where he comes from. He don't know how it happened. He, that's it. He's stuck with this problem, that's all he knows. So what, what was the question again? <laughs> Did you know this is my first lunch as club president? Is that right? Yeah. You're, not, you're not doing such Thank a good job, I'll be honest. <laughs> Given your diplomatic skills here today, are you disappointed that Clinton did not name you Secretary of State? Is that a joke? <laughs> Must be a joke, because I tell you the truth, I wasn't told that I was going to be nominated. So I wasn't so disappointed. Nobody told me I was in consideration, and nobody told me. But I tell you very truthfully, I think that I could have done a much better job as Secretary of State than Mr. Christopher is going to do. I have a lot of respect for him. He has all my qualities. He's short, and he don't talk too good. <laughs> And he looks a little tzahagat, he hasn't got... <laughs> this is going to be an agent of change, he's going to change to his underwear and lay down for an hour.
I don't expect too many fantastic changes from Clinton any more than I expect a new world order from Bush. The biggest fraud in America is the new world order from Bush. You know, I don't like to talk about people. It's not my nature. <laughs> what is this new world order? If he said it's a new world disorder, a new world disarray, a new world in conflict and torment and torture and murder and mayhem and destruction, then he would be telling the truth. He's not ashamed to call this a new world order. There was a half a war when he became president. Now there's wars on every continent, in every house, on every building. There is none, you can't find one neighborhood anywhere in the world that's not at war with each other. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, they're killing innocent people by the thousands. This is the most horrible holocaust since the holocaust. And all you have is a whole government talking about how unfortunate it is, how disgusting it is. Schmuck, do something. That's not his business. You understand this? There's an no-fly zone in Herzegovina. They never observed it for a second. And they keep killing Bosnians, it's nobody's business. One plane in, in, by Saddam Hussein flew someplace out of control for a second and a quarter, a Leifia pot is ready. <laughs> He's running a flit for a schmuck. What is he running, this pot? Do you understand this? You mean when there's oil involved, it counts, but when human life is involved, it doesn't count? Oil is supposed to be for the purpose of people. What is the purpose of oil in the first place? What is the purpose of any of these, uh, uh, huh? <laughs> the resources of the world are here for what reason? That we're to protect and defend and die for what? To serve people. Otherwise, why would you care about oil? What is it to serve, cockroaches? So people don't count, but the oil does? What if you had a world full of oil without people? What do you, what do you need the oil for? Why don't the people in Herzegovina and Bosnia, why don't they count? And the oil of Kuwait does count. Could you figure that out? Son of a bitches. I don't like to talk. I hate to make an issue. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a democracy, but if anybody tells the truth, everybody is shocked. They has the nerve to tell anybody. This is supposed to be a democracy. Why do you look shocked when I tell you this? And why don't you people write this in the paper? You're supposed to be newspaper men. Doesn't this bother you? Rationalizations and excuses of any kind about why we can't defend the people in Bosnia uh, is a fraud and a chicanery and a manipulation of any kind of human decency that ever existed on this earth. Anybody who doesn't send people right now to save the lives of the people of Bosnia is a filthy pig and nobody has a right to call himself concerned about humanity, democracy, when they start rationalizing excuses about not saving those people. The power of France and Germany and America, which could fly right into, into Kuwait to, to save that broken down dictatorship of Kuwait and doesn't uh, tell me that human life is going to become a problem, is all of a sudden a problem over there where we could stop it in five minutes if we wanted to. Son of a bitch. How long of a honeymoon should the American people... <laughs> or will they give Bill Clinton? How long of a honeymoon will they give Bill Clinton? <laughs> I think he should have deserved as much of a honeymoon as he gave the people of Haiti. Did you hear what he just did to the people of Haiti? How come they don't deserve a honeymoon and he does? He said if he becomes the president, the first thing he's going to do is let the people of Haiti come to this country because he said there's nothing more disgusting than what Bush did to the people of Haiti. To turn people back on boats who are, who are fleeing from starvation and, uh, and oppression of the worst kind from a vicious dictatorship in Haiti, that they should be turned away on a boat is the most disgusting thing in the world to him. That's what he said when he was running for office. Nothing changed in Haiti since then. They're suffering the same fate and the, and the same deaths coming from Haiti as they did before. Why suddenly did he announce yesterday that people should be turned back and he's doing it for humanitarian causes? For humanitarian reasons, he wants to kill every Haitian who wants to come to this country. They should either die in Haiti or go back on the boat or don't build the boat because if you're dying, that's not my business because it's dangerous to go on a boat from Haiti. He said, do you know how many people died on the boats coming from Haiti? You know how dangerous it is to be on a boat coming from Haiti? If you weren't going to probably die in Haiti, you wouldn't have been on that boat in the first place, would you? Do you see people in Miami Beach, rich Jews, going on a boat to fly from Haiti? 
The people are on that boat are probably going to get killed or starved to death. That's why they're on those boats. There's no jobs. There's no work. There's no social security, health care. There's nothing. There's no unemployment insurance. People are dying, literally, from starvation in Haiti. That's why he said he was a great humanitarian to let them come in here. Now he says for humanitarian reasons, he announced yesterday, he can't allow them to come in on a boat because it's dangerous to be on that boat. If you'll come on that boat, you're liable to sink. And if you got a good boat, you're liable to reach this place. <laughs> Either way, we can't allow it. Because whether you live or die that way, wrong. You have to die in Haiti for humanitarian reasons. <laughs> now what changed? What changed? He had, a good, he had a good explanation when he was running for office. He says the very the most intelligent answer to the whole problem. When he said, if you're coming from Haiti, at least we should let them into this country. When he was running for office, before he made the speech yesterday, we should at least let them into this country until the Ariste government, what do you call them, Arresta, Aristi, until he could come back or some other democratic form of government could come back. And until that time, while people are still being oppressed, killed, murdered, starving, we should at least allow them in this country until that time to, that the government changes. He said that during the campaign. And it makes sense and it answers to the question of the people who say, how could you allow 100,000 Haitians to come in here? Look how much money it's going to cost us. There's a lot of sick, selfish bastards who said that. But for these sick, selfish bastards, he had an answer. He said, as selfish and as low as you are, if that's so disgusting to you, let me tell you something. We'll only let them stay here until they change the government in Haiti. How much could it cost you? We have enough money for an SNL program to bail out every billionaire thief this country ever had in the hundreds of billions of dollars, but we don't have $300 for, for a poor, pathetic soul who's about to die in Haiti to give him a bowl of soup? A bowl of soup is too much for us, but billions for billionaires is no problem. We can't afford it. This country doesn't have it until at least the government changes in Haiti or we can effectuate a change in that government. Is this country so poverty-stricken that we can't afford it? I'm going to stay here till I get an answer to this question. <laughs> what do you think about the Iran-Contra pardons? I think it's, it goes very well with the uh, pattern of government we expect in this country of people robbing us and defrauding us and doing anything unconstitutional that any president uh, feels like doing as long as he's in office because he feels the power of the presidency will always give him this, the ability and the right to somehow get away with murder. Uh, they say that Roosevelt didn't even have a clear constitutional right to do what he did with reference to Pearl Harbor. Johnson didn't have any clear constitutional right with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. There was no clear definition of constitutional rights in the way we conducted the whole war in Vietnam. Nobody ever voted for it on a constitutional basis. So uh, we jumped into Panama, nobody knows why, how or what right we have to do it. We, we had a push claim that's not a war. When you kill people and you don't announce a war, they didn't die. <laughs> a few thousand people died in Panama, it wasn't a war. Does Bush have a right to claim it wasn't a war? Huh? When, uh, when Ronald Reagan said that we never traded arms for hostages, we never offered arms for hostages, he looked you right in the face and lied to the whole country and changed his mind a month later. He said, how do you like that? Maybe we traded a little arms for hostages. It wasn't real arms, it was small arms. I wasn't, I wasn't here when they were arming. I'm not really a, who I didn't remember being elected. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> And now we have Bush pulling the greatest fraud of all time when he decided that, uh, what's his name, Blumgarten, Weingarten? Weinberg. Weinberg. <laughs> he pardoned Weinberg, and Weinberg said, the reason they pardoned me is that uh, I didn't do nothing wrong. They wanted me to go tell the truth about Bush, the know of these Nazi bastards, that they have the right to call this an investigation. That's not an investigation, that's catching people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind they make an investigation, but they catch me in the middle of an investigation. <laughs> and what right do they have to spend so much money on an investigation and spend so many years on an investigation? You know why? Because people like him and all the others didn't want to answer any questions. So when people don't ask you questions, you have to keep searching. When you keep searching and looking, it takes people. And people have to get paid, so it costs money to catch him. Then when they caught him, he said, to waste all this money just to catch me? <laughs> These Nazi bastards. 
That's why Dole says now we have to put a stop to this investigation. It's a mockery, it's a fraud. It certainly is a mockery and a fraud because if you could catch them and then when they get caught, instead of going to jail, they get pardoned, then what is the purpose of the investigation? To catch a crook. If you're going to do nothing about it after you caught him, the purpose of the investigation doesn't exist anymore. That's why he has a right to claim now that the whole system stinks. You know why? Because he and the rest of the thieves are going to get away with it anyway. That's it. <laughs> How would you compare Israel's expulsion of suspected terrorists and Kuwait's expulsion of Palestinians uh, upon the return of the Emir? Well, I would say there's definitely a major difference. I don't know whether Israel is right in, expulging, uh, in the expulsion of those 400 people because I don't know by what, uh, by what procedure Israel determined that all of them are so necessarily involved in, in, uh, in this collective guilt of terrorism. I don't know how many of them are real terrorists, how many were suspected, what trials did they have, how, how do you know how, how, uh, how substantial it is that the, the investigations were made, on what basis the judgments were comp concluded or completed, so I don't know how much I could justify uh, the expulsion of the whole 400 of them. To compare it to, to you're, you're comparing this with what? Expulsion of Palestinians from Kuwait. After the the expulsion of Palestinians from Kuwait was, was never even noticed or, or it didn't even involve any concern or, or curiosity or interest from the press of the world. I hate to attack the press here because I assume that most of you have something to do with the press. <laughs> but could you understand this, why, why literally hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who lived in Kuwait all their lives were expelled like dirt and garbage and destroyed. You saw it on television. The evidence of this was there every day. And the press never made a particular issue out of it. The press of the world didn't make an issue out of it. It was Saddam Hussein decided to throw them out, to, to declare war against Kuwait. Right? Kuwait didn't fight that war. We fought the war. The Emir and all the people from Kuwait who lived in Kuwait decided not to fight for Kuwait. They ran out to look at it through eyeglasses on television. They were watching it on C-SPAN or CNN. The people whose own country was involved and whose product was involved, whose resources, whose life, whose future, whose, whose survival was involved, were totally unconcerned with it. I was in that neighborhood at the time. They were all hiding like thieves, the people from Kuwait, while American soldiers were getting killed. Then as soon as they came back, they threw out all the Palestinians like they were garbage, like you throw out dirt into a garbage can. They meant nothing to them. People who had established their lives there for hundreds of years. They never committed any atrocities against Kuwait. Some did. Some were complicitous with, with Saddam Hussein. But most of them didn't face any trials. They didn't care about trying people as, on an individual basis. They just collectively destroyed them and threw them out and killed them in the streets. There was a, practically a genocide against Palestinians. If they were left over there, their lives were, weren't worth a nickel as soon as a guy from Kuwait took a look at them, as soon as they could be identified. Every one of them's lives were in danger, in trouble, either of living there or being thrown out of there or getting killed there. That was their fate if they were Palestinians. And the press of the world said, how do you like that? <laughs> That's life. That's how it goes. If you take chances, you can get killed. Nobody cared about hundreds of thousands of, of, of Palestinians getting killed in Kuwait. And here are real terrorists who are, who are killing soldiers in, in Israel every day, or bombing every day. There's terrorist activities going on every day against Israel. And when we catch them, we don't know if, how, to what extent these 400 are guilty or not, but Israel is condemned immediately without an investigation. Would you call this equal justice? I don't think so. Do you have any observations regarding political differences between Jews and Gentiles? Political differences? Yes. I don't see any political differences between Jews and Gentiles. I, I think they just talk different. <laughs> I think uh, Gentiles uh, tend to be less sophisticated politically than Jews. Because <laughs> I don't think Gentiles read the paper as carefully as a Jew does. Because a Jew has to get up complaining about something, otherwise... <laughs> mm -hmm. A Gentile is more likely to accept life as it goes and to accept the idea of uh, 
Whatever happens, happens. He's used to not making such a comfortable living, so it's close enough. <laughs> but a Jew can't get up thinking that it's going to be like this another week and a half. He's got to get mad at somebody, a partner, a boss, a wife, a sister-in-law. He gets up furious because he's got to do better. He doesn't know better than what, but as soon as he heard somebody else is making a living, he's mad. <laughs> so a Jew has to spend his life getting even with somebody. He don't know who. I never saw a Jew without a lawsuit, did you? <laughs> as, soon as, you know, as soon as you own anything, he convinces himself you stole it off him. And if not for him, you never would have made a living. And I'm your partner, you rat bastard. <laughs> That's a slight exaggeration. I don't know if you noticed that. But the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, thousands of years of persecution has an effect on your psyche. You can't deny that if you come here for, as a persecuted minority and your father and mother were struggling and suffering to get ahead and you knew that you were facing discrimination at every turn and in every effort to get anywhere in life, you become very intense about accomplishing something because you feel you have a lot to overcome. The system is basically against you. You're an outsider looking in and you have to fight twice as hard to get ahead. Every Jew is a natural born Avis. He's always second, trying to compete with the guy that's there first. What would you do about the health care crisis in the United States? I would, I would try not to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, the most preposterous story of the world, if somebody said to you, if somebody tried to think of this, if somebody said to you, a country like Israel, where it's only worth a dollar and a quarter, and depends on charity donations from all over the world to even go to work in the morning, could afford a health care system. If Canada, which we laugh at as a country that's got nothing, that has to keep begging us for help every 20 minutes. If we don't open a factory in Montreal, there's no factories there. Half of the country is trying to separate because they're talking French and everybody talking English is mad at every Frenchman. They can't even paint the sign without a fight. It's all, the whole country is in turmoil. The president is now... Uh, What's his name? The Gentile? <laughs> What's his name? Mulroney. Mulroney is down to 7% popularity. They forgot he's even got the job. The whole country is off service. They can't afford anything. If you want to buy a shirt, 12 people have to chip in to make a deal. They can't make a deal. But they can, but they can afford health care. But we can't. Switzerland can afford health care. Every place in the world, every democracy on earth could somehow afford health care. We're the only country that can't. We got hundreds of billions of dollars for everything to buy. And every Jew has a Mercedes, every Gentile has at least a Chevrolet, right? <laughs> <laughs> there isn't a person here that can't afford a house, a trip to Miami, to Venezuela, to Turkey. Every time you say hello, the guy says, I'm not working, it's murder. Where are you going? On a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has enough money for everything in this country, but we can't afford it. If a person catches a cold, it's wiped out. There's nobody here with enough money to, for, for, for an insurance program for health care. And there's nobody can afford to make sure that the people in the United States stay healthy when they can afford it in every other country in the world. We could afford all of a sudden if tomorrow we feel like bombing Eurasia. But we find out Saddam Hussein, the, the biggest schmuck war of all time is the whole situation with Saddam Hussein. I don't mean to change the subject. But listen to this. Why did Bush get mad about Saddam Hussein? Why? Because he said he might, he, if you don't stop him now, he could wipe out the whole world. This is another Hitler. He compared him to Hitler in four different speeches. He said, this guy could wipe out the whole world if you let him stay there. It's not just Kuwait. We have to wipe out this man. Because he, let's assume he gives us back Kuwait. And if he's still there, how do you know he won't try to wipe out the whole world a month from now? He had such clarity of purpose that it was impossible to imagine that this man was a total schmuck. All of a sudden, for this reason, because he could be the next Adolf Hitler, we attacked him. And as soon as we found out that we might actually hurt him, we quit. Because we said if we actually hurt him to the extent that we catch him or wipe him out, who knows what could happen next? 
Who knows what could happen next? There could be a whole revolution in Iraq, and Iraq could get involved with Iran, and between the Kurds and the Khalayas, there will be a whole big series, and there'll be a fight, an argument, who knows? There'll be turmoil, problems, torture. We cannot wipe out Saddam Hussein. It would be the dumbest thing we ever did. Why was it the smartest thing before the war and the dumbest thing when it was time to catch it? If I'm chasing you, as soon as I'm about to catch you, I quit. Why? Because if I catch you, it'll be a murderous problem. So what am I chasing you for, schmuck? Do <laughs> you understand this? The purpose was to wipe out Saddam Hussein from any future possibility of him creating any new wars all over the world. So we bombed out every hospital, which we claimed was a war, a war zone, a munitions factory. We found out now they were not munitions factory. It turns out to be hospitals. They, at that time, we said they looked like hospitals, but they're factories. <laughs> After we bombed them out, they were hospitals, but they looked like factories. <laughs> <laughs> and we wiped out thousands of innocent men, women, and children for nothing. Why? Because we were looking for him. So we wiped out everybody except him. Do you understand this? Because we said, if we, now if we leave him there, the problem will be solved. This will be, create a whole new world order. The new world order will be that Saddam Hussein will survive. The Kurds and the, uh, what the, uh, what the, uh, the Shiites, and the Shiites, he'll be, first of all, he allowed them to kill the Kurds and the Shiites for another six months after the war was over. They allowed him to kill another two, three hundred thousand Kurds and Shiites. This is the new part of the new world order to give Saddam Hussein the opportunity. You see, if we killed Saddam Hussein, we would create disorder. Disorder means he would be a threat. He might kill other people. But if we save him, and then he kills everybody, it's none of our business because we can get involved in interrelationships in the, within countries where they have festering problems for so many years that they killed hundreds of thousands of people for nothing. That's not our field. We stopped him from taking over Kuwait to protect the oil, and then we stopped from catching him because there should be a world order. Then he killed 300,000 people and it became none of our business because that kind of disorder is not our field. Our field is oil and disorder. If he goes to other countries, if he kills everybody in the neighborhood, none of your business. Do you understand this? So, we, so then Bush came in and, and the, we created a no-fly zone to make sure we protect the Kurds and the Shiites from any future incursions by him to, to be free to kill people for nothing. The first 300,000 we didn't mind. That was none of our business. The next 300,000 is our business. Why do these other 300,000 Kurds and Shiites who are left our business but the others aren't? Are we protecting only brother-in-laws or cousins? The fathers don't count. The, the people who were there before, their lives were not so valuable. These are. Or is it a policy that we had to evolve and, uh, and, and develop only after 300,000 people are killed? Do I have to have a right to shoot up half of this country and kill everybody and then you stop me only from killing the rest, the other half of this country? Why doesn't the first half count? Why were those lives about to be allowed to be destroyed, decimated? Where was Bush and why did he justify himself for not being involved? And if we're not being involved because this is inter-party politics within the country, and which is none of our business because it goes back so many ages and that was his excuse, then what is our excuse for protecting, the, for protecting the rest of them? They're part of the same excuse for not protecting the first 300,000. When did it change? What changed? Huh? So now we have Saddam Hussein still there and now we say we still can't wipe him out because if we, God forbid, we wiped him out, it would be a big problem. To wipe him out would be the biggest problem in the world. So we have to keep him there to make sure he doesn't cause trouble. So every week he causes trouble, and every week we figure out how to keep bombing him so it shouldn't be a problem. So this problem will go out with bombing and killings without an answer for this or a solution, and nobody knows now what to do about a problem that was supposed to have been solved when he knew exactly what to do when it all started. The exact thing to do when it started is to wipe him out because he shouldn't be another Hitler. Now we found out that the best idea is to make sure he's there so there shouldn't be a problem. So if that's the reason, why should we have attacked him in the first place? I don't know. <laughs> How would you solve the deficit problem? By raising more money. Is there something I said, mister?
Must be related to Saddam Hussein. He didn't like the last few months. How would I solve the deficit problem? Perot is the only guy who gave you the answer about solving the deficit problem. Everybody said that Perot is the only guy who doesn't give him solutions. He only gives you problems. And he had no solutions. That's what everybody said. The exact opposite was true. He's the only guy who gave you solutions about the deficit problem. They gave you, they gave you sacrifices you had to make in order to pay them for the deficit. And, be, and he brought out charts every single week on television explaining to you, this is the sacrifices we would all have to make in order to pay off the deficit. Now Clinton all of a sudden found out that there is a deficit that he never knew existed. He didn't believe Bush about anything else. He called him a fraud about everything. But the, about the deficit, he believed him. It was in the paper, schmuck, there's a deficit. Now he said, how do you like that? I never knew there was such a deficit. <laughs> do you believe this? He says he didn't know the size of it. There's a, there's a budget office, an accounting office that told you exactly what the deficit was going to be. The biggest lie on the site, even the bigger lie than the whole idea of the Iran-Contra stories and Bush's stories and Reagan's, is Clinton's story that he had no idea what the deficit was going to be. Is there any newspaper man who believes that? That he didn't know what the Look how shocked he is. And now he's reneging on every promise he made a week and a half ago. He kept attacking Bush about, read my lips, no new taxes. He had said in one of the debates, he said, the thing he had no right to say in that debate was read my lips, no new taxes. Because if he wasn't positive, if he didn't make a research program out of being definitive and conclusive that it's impossible for him to raise taxes, he had no business to saying it. Whether he meant to lie or not, you have no right to say something you can't be positive of in the times of the future. If you can't swear for it, don't promise it. This man promised a middle class income tax cut, didn't he? He said it just as definitively, as conclusively as Bush did. He didn't use the words, read my lips, but he wanted you to read his lips because he, 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 he huh? <laughs> he based his whole, his whole campaign on one of the most prime premises of that whole campaign was the whole idea of a middle class tax cut. That was his way of appealing to the middle class of America. That was his version of the Ronald Reagan, uh, get the government off your, off your backs of the middle class routine. That was another version of the Ronald Reagan routine of how to win over the middle class by telling him, read my lips, no new taxes. And before that, Reagan said, we have to back off the middle class of America. Clinton's gimmick was the middle class taxes should be cut immediately. And there's no excuse for middle class people paying this much taxes. Soon he was elected. He's got 12 people sitting in front of different committees saying, the deficit is much more than we expected. Nobody heard of such a deficit. <laughs> but it was in the paper. We don't read papers. We're very busy here. <laughs> and uh, we heard about it, but nobody told us directly. We never heard it. We never it. There, was, uh, there was problems all over the world. Who got time to read a paper? We had, uh, <laughs> and just because it was in the paper and people said it doesn't mean we should believe it. We didn't know it. We never heard of it. We're not accountants. This is not our business. But now that it's here, the middle class will have to pay. Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, <laughs> this is not for us to figure out. <laughs> But you think the middle class will not get a tax cut? We can't say they won't, but we can't say they will. We don't know if there is a middle class. We have to look into it. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now, now everybody is saying that uh, Clinton was, was trying to tell you the truth, and P but Perot was, was, uh, was the phony. Perot was supposedly, now everybody's trying to paint Perot as the maniac. He's the only guy who told the truth about the economy and about deficits. He told you that unless you make these and these sacrifices, the deficit will not be affected by it. And the numbers that Clinton has will not work out. His numbers are based on fraud. Perot said it, Bush said it, and Clinton kept giving excuses for it like he did about the draft. He sent a letter to a general thanking him for making sure that he wasn't drafted. Remember that? He says, thank God you kept me out of the draft. I'll send you a birthday present for this. <laughs> you need a couple of shirts, a piece of cake, whatever you want. Thank God. And then he tells the country, <laughs> they wanted me. I was ready to go. They didn't call me. They forgot to call me. They almost called me. I was on my way. How do I know they forgot my number? They lost my place. <laughs> That made as much sense as they forgot to inhale that routine. You remember the routine about forgot to inhale? Would you put a pastrami sandwich in your mouth if you didn't want to swallow it? Yeah. <laughs> you ever see a guy walking around with a pastrami? What are you doing? <laughs> The man is a phony, let's be honest. 
And I say this in honor of his inauguration. <laughs> he deserves to be a president like I deserve to be a bookkeeper. It's not my field. If it's not your field, take a walk. Let that man who knows his business do something about it. And I don't say this with any disrespect. <laughs> if it's not your field, don't bother Jewish people. Maybe there's some Gentiles in Arkansas who think he deserves the job. Isn't it ironic? When he ran for, for, for governor of Arkansas, he got a less percentage of the vote than he got in Arkansas for being president. Which means that the people in Arkansas would rather see him out of the state than in it. Who do you think Ronald Reagan really voted for, Bush or Clinton? I read that story that he supposedly voted for Clinton. I don't believe it because I don't think he knew who he was voting for. <laughs> <laughs> I know Ronald, Ronald Reagan made less sense as a president probably than any president we ever had. Uh, if you had to study, the, if a guy came to you with qualifications for the president, first thing they said about Clinton when they were, when they were screaming against him becoming president is what does he know about foreign policy? If you're a governor from Arkansas, are you involved in foreign policy? It's a very credible question. Why couldn't they ask the same question about Ronald Reagan? The Republicans, who were the proudest people of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy, I'm not ashamed to say this about, Cl about Clinton, when they put a man in office whose greatest accomplishments are foreign policy, who broke down the Berlin Wall, who put an end to communism, whose foreign policy genius outstripped and outmaneuvered all the po foreign policy intellectuals of our country. People like George Keenan, all the foreign policy geniuses like Kissinger, they were all involved in a big hassle and a battle with Reagan on foreign policy issues with reference to Russia the whole time of his presidency. And this man who knew nothing about foreign policy was right about nothing but foreign policy. And the reason he was, was, it was, uh, he, was uh, he was the world's turkey as a president in terms of domestic policy, he created all kinds of thievery in this country under the name of deregulation. The, there's no bigger fraud on the site than the words deregulation. Would you, would you observe deregulation in your own life? What is regulation? Regulation is to make sure people don't rob you who don't deserve it. That's why you have regulations. Don't you have it in your own life? When you have an accountant, don't you make sure that you look it over to make sure he's honest? Is that regulation? Do you have a red light on the corner? Isn't that regulation? Do you have a lock on your door? Is that regulation? Do you have a lawyer when you sign a contract? Is that regulation? You don't live your life without regulation. Well, as soon as you have a quarter involved, there's regulations to protect you. And you use those regulations to make sure you are protected. So why should a government have no regulations? It's easier to rob this whole government than to rob your house. And when they rob this whole government, aren't they robbing you? So why should your door be protected, but your business with the government should not be protected? Why? Huh? <laughs> when you go to the butcher, you want to, don't you want to make sure your pound of meat is a real pound of meat? Is that regulation? That that scale should be judged? That should be investigated? That it should be protected? So what if it's on a national level? Then all of a sudden it doesn't count? Because should everybody put anything in a container that they please and sell it to you under any name they want and defraud you on any level they please, like the SNLs and the HUD scandals and all the other scandals that should never be regulated? Is everybody dishonest except them? Do you need protection every place in America except when somebody does business with the government, which could wipe out everybody in this country? And that's why they did wipe out everybody in this country. Because Reagan's great pride is deregulation. Go ahead. <laughs> What's your next question? <laughs> what kind of marks would you give New York Governor Mario Cuomo, a longtime resident of Queens? <laughs> a long time resident of Queens. What has that got to do with him as a, as a governor? Let's assume he was a good time resident of Pittsburgh. Does that make him a better Spe governor? Specifically with the Crown Heights controversy. Well, I do, I, I do know that uh, Mario Cuomo has a vested interest in being a Democrat, and politics is the, is the Bible of the politicians, and staying in office is their main ambition in life, and it's hard to find any politician who's going to be honest when it's, when it, uh, when it's somehow uh, is in conflict with any possibilities of his own political future. So I can't expect Mario Cuomo to be more honest about Crown Heights when he has to protect his bailiwick like Dinkins in the, in, the, in the city government and when Dinkins neglected the Crown Heights situation and allowed Jews to be terrorized and killed in the streets of, uh, of Crown Heights for four days or three and a half days before he took any action. 
I'm not at all surprised that Mario Cuomo was finding rationalizations and excuses to defend it, because I think Mario Cuomo is basically a decent man, and I think so is Dinkins. But when your own political life is involved and your future as a politician, all decency goes out of the window, and decency ends where your political future begins. And I think Cuomo is neglecting the issue of Crown Heights and justifying Dinkins' uh, neglectful behavior about that whole situation and is uh, perpetuating the myth that uh, nothing could have been done or could have been done better because he cares more about justifying the Democratic Party problems than the reality of the situation. Before asking the final question, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Well, this comes from who? The National Press Club. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and a book written by two National Press Club members, Paul Richardson Fleming and Judith Lusky, The North American Indians in Early Photographs. Oh. <laughs> I I'll tell you the truth, I was very concerned about this problem. I was, I was hoping that if I came here, I'd finally come to grips with the problem of the North American Indian. <laughs> I always knew about the problem in Crown Heights, but I didn't know the North American Indians are now suffering too. But I think that's neglect on my part, because I shouldn't be proud that I was not aware of the problems of the North American Indians. But I don't hear from them lately, so I wasn't talking about them. <laughs> I don't know if they looked involved when they had trouble in Crown Heights. So I forgot to get involved with, uh, with the North American Indians. But as long as there's a book on the subject, I'm going to read this as soon as they read about Crown Heights. <laughs> I think that's only fair. I want to thank the National Press Club. It, it, I don't get many opportunities to work for nothing. <laughs> And I, I, I cherish this opportunity, because working, working for nothing is an ambition I've had all my life. <laughs> and I say that in all sincerity, because you have to be successful to be able to afford to work for nothing. So every time I work for nothing, it reminds me of how successful I am. I hope, I, I hope you don't ask me to do this again. I've been successful enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I really want to thank you because I, I think that this was an opportunity for me to express my deep uh, humanitarian concerns about the future of not only of this country, this whole world, because I know that unless people like me talk up and talk out and tell the truth, people like you will never find out what's going on. <laughs> God bless you. Now, uh, one, uh, Our final question. Earlier you said you were from Alabama. What part of Alabama are you from? <laughs> I said, uh, do I talk this way because I don't want people to realize, not to, who don't know that I come from New York, I don't want them to think that I come from Alabama. But I was never in Alabama. I'm not going to Alabama. <laughs> I never heard one good word about Alabama. <laughs> That's not nice to say because this is on C-SPAN and I'm sure people will be watching it who do come from Alabama, although by now, after hearing me talk for an hour, I don't think there's anybody from Alabama still watching. <laughs> I'd like to say goodbye to my aunt and uncle in Alabama. Thank you. <laughs> Send your comments about Mr. Mason's remarks to the National Press Club Library, care of the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20045. Oh, no, no, he enjoyed it. He had a good time. Good. He could go on forever with this, you know? We could listen to it for another hour. Yeah. Too. I would love to come back and do it again. Really? Yes. I'd love to have it. It was a good campaign. <laughs> No, but this is, this is uh, you know, he, he enjoys it. It's also good he works out. Oh, he plays well. Well, I tell you, 
Uh, we're inviting Cuomo to my inauguration, so if he doesn't come. <laughs> maybe he maybe Jack will come. <laughs> on, on From Washington, D.C., this is C-SPAN 2, a cable satellite public affairs network. Here's our latest schedule update. Coming next, a speech on the Middle East peace process by Israel's new ambassador to the United States. Following that, at 2.45 a.m. Eastern Time, it's coverage of a congressional hearing on how to rebuild and reinvest in America's roads, bridges, and highways. And at 7.40 a.m. Eastern Time, it's the Senate confirmation hearing for Education Secretary nominee Richard Riley. That's our latest C-SPAN 2 schedule update. Planning a trip to Washington? Make sure you have your copy of C-SPAN's Exploring the Capitol, a self-guided tour through the halls of Congress. In its pages, you'll learn the history, meet the people, and discover the architecture of this national landmark. To charge your copy of Exploring the Capitol, call toll-free 1-800-523-2000.